So, ever since you left Rockefeller, you know, I feel like you've been you've been involved in different types of projects and clothing. You know, you had the film project and so forth. And then out of the blue, I find out that you're actually managing an artist. So explain how this thing kind of came together. Uh, well, Tata had played me some music uh, from um, St. John's one day and during Fashion Week and went to this Pierre Moss uh, fashion show where he actually introduced himself and we met and I believe we exchanged numbers and since then, Passionate about the album called Collection One. Couldn't stop listening to it. Thought it was probably definitely top three albums, um, breakout albums, I would say, put out last year, if not the best project, period. Um, and so uh, I was going around speaking to people about St. John before he and I um, even met again. You know, Ebro, a couple other people saying that they should um, really pay attention to the album because he's from Brooklyn, a New York guy. And him hearing about that reached out to me and we had lunch, built a genuine relationship, asked me to come listen to the next project, hung out for two months. Um, and it was something I was passionate about. And he asked me, you know, to, uh, he was like, well, what do you think? So um, went back, spoke to Tata and was like, look, I'm thinking about this. He was like, well, you're really passionate about it and you love the music. It seems like a natural fit. And I don't do anything halfway, so called Saint back up and was like, all right, let's do it. And that brings us here, Circle of Success Management. Dope. Very dope. All right, so so St. John, well, let's talk about your story. This is your first time here. Mm -hmm. So you were born in Brooklyn. Yeah, East New York. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, lastly East New York, yeah. Okay. And you're actually uh, Guyanese yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So growing up, you were kind of splitting time between Brooklyn and Guyana. Yeah, Georgetown, Guyana. Okay, what was that like? I was tough at first. I had to, it's hard transitioning from country to country. I don't know if it sounds exotic now, but as a kid, you're being uprooted from, your friends are different. You gotta get accustomed to change. Uh, so that was hard for a long time. Right, and you know, I think what a lot of people, you know, if you don't travel outside of America, you don't really have a good understanding of what poverty really is. Yeah. You know, East New York is a rough area, but Guyana poverty is on a whole different level. Yeah, third world poverty is a completely different, unexplored thing. So, and I talk about that, I tell, when people ask me, what's it like growing up in two different continents or two different countries, I get to see first world poverty, which is American poverty, which you still get food stamps and subsidized government you know, aid. There's no subsidize anything. There's no government assistance when you're in a third world country. It's, you're going to have to learn how to sell mangoes and coconuts and figure out what kalalu, what the weight of that is going to go for, you know, just real things. Yeah. And that was something else I would say we had in, uh, in common, even though St. Thomas is a U.S. Virgin Island. I was born in Harlem, but grew up, you know, going back and forth in St. Thomas. So experienced some of them same things. Right. Like, I haven't been to, to Guyana or St. Thomas, but I have been to, like, you know, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and so forth. And if you're poor in those places, you don't have running water. Uh, you're sleeping on a piece of foam. You know what I mean? It's, if it's that. very, it's if that. very different than living in like the projects where you have base, basic cable and you know. Mostly you living in you mostly living in Ashanti. It's called exactly. So Guyana was kind of like that. Yeah, Guyana is a rough place for people without means. I was just a poor kid growing up, so we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, my pops, he was around when I was in Guyana through different intervals, so he would help try to make it easier. But it was a tough, you know, we were struggling. So I guess you started doing music around 12, 13? Yeah, something like that. I was, maybe I was 11 or something like that. I don't completely remember. I was, I was just young, and I, I started. I just started. Okay. And the early music, was it kind of traditional hip hop? Was it R&B? What was it initially? No, I was rapping. I don't even think You're I'd listen to an R&B song. I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought you were soft if you listen to R&B. I was like, <laughs> what? I, I hadn't heard any R&B music. I was like, singing, what's that? And my brother was a rapper, so I started rapping. If he was singing, I guess I'd have sung. And it wouldn't have been so soft to me at the time. 
Okay. So, at what point did the music start to really do something? Uh, after I started writing for other people, that was a real. That was the first real opportunities that I ever got in the music business. When I was writing, because you could, there's real, there's money, right? And money puts you in business. So we're in business because I'm earning. I can earn a dollar or something. It was the first time I'd earned a reasonable dollar in music. I'd written a song. I don't remember the first person I ever wrote a song for. I do, in fact, I forgot. I wrote a record for a kid in New York, and the record sort of blew up for him. And at the time, blowing up, it was you know 20 million streams or something like that, or 30 or 40 million streams, something like that. Oh, who was it? And I was a kid named Hoodie Allen. Okay, yeah, I know that name. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I guess Zach Katz uh, hooked up with you early on? Yeah. Zach Katz was one of, was the first executive that I'd ever sat down with and had a real dialogue. And he gave me some, he gave me some gems. He gave me some tools that I carried with me. I remember one of the first things he said, Zach was like, you want to make, you want to rap, but you want to make a million dollars. And I was like, fam, I saw what rapping looked like. Can I explore the other option? So we did. Yeah, Zach is my man. Like I've known Zach for like maybe twelve years or, or something like that. Yeah, real, real good dude. Real good dude. I mean, he he was the president of BMG until recently. Um, right. He so went from I guess, Beluga Heights, which was mm -hmm. him, Jr. wrote him, and I guess Jr. Jr.'s brother when they had acts like uh, Jason Rulo and Ayaz and Sean Kingston. Yeah, Sean Kingston, I think, was one of their first. Uh, the first signings. So I guess Zach had you writing for Rihanna. Initially. Well, that's the first thing he ever said was, yo, can you pitch, um, can you write these records, you know, for her? And I didn't know what that meant at the time. At the time, I thought it was much more elaborate and sexy than I than what it turned out to be. It just meant write some songs that you think will fit her. And we'll send it to the person that'll send it to the person that'll send it to the person that's standing next to her. That's really it, right? That's kind of what pitching is until you get to a certain level and then you could almost text the song yourself. Okay, and I guess you were writing for Rihanna but none of the songs actually got used. Yeah, I wasn't writing. That's a, <laughs> that's quite a stretch. I wasn't writing for her. I wanted to. That was, it was aspirational. You gotta you make it sound way too decorative. It was, yeah, I was pitching. I was writing spec songs. Got it, okay, so you were just submitting ideas. Yeah. And, okay, got it. Yeah, but you actually hopeful. went on, uh, well, you ended up, Working, I mean, writing for a bunch of different people like Jadena and um, got a list here. Hold on, uh, Usher, Jadena, who else? Uh, Nico and Vince, a girl named Kaiser, a couple other people. Okay, so were these songs actually, you know, getting placed at some point? Yeah, it started to work out. So, how was that? Now, suddenly, you're actually, you know, in business. You're now actually getting paid to you know to do music for a living. It was a dream come true when you think about it, because when you stand on the sidelines your entire life, the first time you get put in the game, no matter what happens, the first time you're in the game, you think you're Jordan. Miss, scored, lose the ball, whatever. You in the game, you on the court, so it felt great. Okay. And then you actually started releasing your own music. Well, I was re I was releasing my own music before that. So I stumbled into songwriting because I wrote a song for a friend of mine. I put out two projects before that, just on the internet, just creating relationships with blogs and, you know, sort of finding my own path. And then I wrote a song for a friend and that ended up in Zach's hands. And Zach said, yo, write this song so I can pitch it to someone. And I came back to New York. I was in LA for like two months and I came back to New York and I wrote this record for called No Interruption for Hoodie Allen. And then I found my way and then I started writing records for Usher and other people. And after that, because I was writing for a couple years, for several years for certain. And after that, I started putting on my own records when I realized there was a shift. There was a complete shift in the way music was being consumed and distributed and how money was being made. And I always had a keen sense of business because when you grow up poor, you just want a little bit more. It's not enough to just be creative and talented. I had to, so I had to use my mind to get out of my situation. It wasn't just my talent. Yeah. Well, and at one point, I guess you started opening up for Post Malone. Yeah, yeah. We went on a couple tours together. I mean, that's a big deal right there. Yeah, it's good to have friends. I mean, Post Malone is, I mean, these days, one of the biggest artists in the world, pretty much. Arguably, yeah. yeah. Top, definitely top five. <laughs> I mean, in terms of just, 
overall streams and, and sales and so forth. Okay. Did things change to, change for you once you started doing those types of uh, shows? Well, opportunities change, right? So I got sharper because it's one thing to put out records and it's another thing to perform them. So people were hearing the records and then people got to see me and I was developing this cult-like following. So I got to, I got, I got the opportunity to be exposed to an audience that I didn't know, which is incredible for an artist, right? You need that. You need the look. So I got the look and I needed to maximize it. So I maximized it. I remember when Post Malone, you know, started opening up for Justin Bieber, you know, went on that tour. And I, I think like White Iverson was, was the only song that was really out that I knew about. And then, you know, I think that that stepping stone turned Post Malone into what he is today. So it, it's kind of like, you know, and then you're opening up for Post Malone, which is kind of a stepping stone for you as well. Because, I mean, I'm looking at some of these songs, you know, like Roses is almost like 10 million views. You know, Reflex is almost like 5 million views. Uh, you have a whole bunch of songs that are in the millions without really a lot of mainstream exposure or anything of that sort. It all seems to be like a real underground kind of cult type of following. Yeah, it's super organic. And you're just talking about the views that are on YouTube. There's, they're in the double digits of millions in every other platform. You're talking on all the other streaming platforms, 30, 40, you know, millions on these songs. So I developed a real following, a real audience around the world. I just did, I was doing the work. I, I wouldn't even call it work because this is just a pa this is passion for me. But now I could afford Saint Laurent shoes, so I guess there's a, some work in it, right? <laughs> uh, right. I mean, because because the style is just very different. I mean, it, it's it, it's rapping, but it's but it's you know not not really rapping like traditional rapping. You well, yeah, you saying? can hear you can hear the emphasis. You can hear the core of what I come from. But what's the point of doing what I've already seen done? What's the use in that? What's the evolution in that? It's, that's not even exciting for me. That's not exciting for me to listen to or make. So this yeah. is, it's, it's music. It's just progressive. It's based on what I learned or what I acquired and where I want to go with it. So this is where I'm taking it. Yeah, man. Congrats. I mean, to get those types of views on all those different platforms, that's something that even commercial artists don't get. You see what I'm saying? Like artists yeah. that, that are like household names aren't getting. And you have, like I said, like a, you know, like you said, a very organic kind of audience. Because you know, I'll be honest, I didn't really know the Saint John name until until Biggs kind of connected it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I could I could understand that too. I was quietly working. I think that's the best way to possibly work. When no one's watching, when all the lights are off and everyone's asleep, I was working. So I went and I did all the shows. I did every possible festival I could do. It didn't matter if there were, when I went to Belgium and there were 20 people in the audience, I performed like there were 100,000. It was the same for me. Because yeah. I was in a moment that I'd created for myself, an opportunity that I'd given myself through my own efforts. So I was here, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, man. And uh, the Lust video, uh, I very much enjoyed that video. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, visuals, video. The, the visuals in that video were great. Let, let, yeah. me just, let me just put that out there. It's very important. That's a good video. It's worth seeing. It's worth, it's seeing. worth seeing. If you haven't seen the last video, watch it by yourself. Don't have your girl around. Just, <laughs> just you go, definitely go watch, watch that by video yourself. by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it might get you into a little bit of Is that why watch. we got those views up? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, possibly. <laughs> you definitely got a few views from me.